Good morning and good afternoon. This is Lauren Wenzel at the National Marine Protected Area Center and I'm pleased to welcome you all to our MPA webinar series. Today we've got a really great presentation for you on um, harnessing ecological spatial connectivity for effective marine protected areas and resilient marine ecosystems. So this is work that was developed by the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee and we're going to hear from the subcommittee chair, Mark Carr, uh, who helped develop that work, and also uh, a co-presenter, Sarah Robinson, who was also a co-chair of the subcommittee, unfortunately is not able to be with us today. She's uh, down sick with the flu, but I will introduce both of them in a moment and then turn it over to Mark. But before I do, I just wanted to go over uh, some some quick background. First of all, I want to thank our, our co-sponsors of this webinar series, EBM Tools and Open Channels. And as always, we will be posting a copy of this uh, presentation on the MPA Center website and a recording of the webinar on Open Channels. So if you miss it um, or you want to share it with friends and colleagues, please feel free to do that. We'll, we'll make sure that you have that information available. Also, um, We'll be having the presentation for the first part of this webinar, and then we will have plenty of time for questions and answers at the end. So I encourage you to type your questions and comments in the question interface on the, on the webinar interface on the side there, um, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation and, and encourage you to, uh, to participate in that part. So now I would like to go ahead and introduce our speaker today. Mark Carr is a marine ecologist in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of California at Santa Cruz, and he is also an investigator with the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies of Coastal Oceans, also known as PISCO. Mark's research focuses on coastal marine fishes and coastal marine ecosystems. His work informs marine conservation and management policies, including the design and evaluation of MPAs and he is a member of the MPA Federal Advisory Committee and co-chaired the subcommittee on ecological connectivity with Sarah Robinson. And even though she can't be here today with us, I would like to uh, introduce Sarah and thank her for all her work on this. Uh, Dr. Robinson is a lawyer, legal historian, and legal anthropologist. She litigated appellate environmental cases for the U.S. Department of Justice before turning to further training and research, and her research focuses on the history, design, implementation, and effects of fishery management programs in New England. And she has been a member of the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee and uh, led the committee's work on healthy coastal communities and MPAs, and also the most recent work on connectivity and MPAs with Mark Carr. So happy to turn it over to you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Lauren. Um, before I launch into this, uh, I do, on behalf of the MPA Federal Advisory Committee, want to thank Sarah Carr, Joanne Flanders, yourself, Lauren, um, and uh, everybody else who has taken time out of the day to participate in this webinar um, for this opportunity to share with you these recent this recent work that we've been involved in exploring the implications of ecological spatial connectivity and climate change on how we use, design, and manage uh, marine protected areas. So I want to start um, by giving this overview of the what, where we're going to go for the next 30 to 40 minutes. I'll start quickly with a brief background on the MPA Federal, Federal Advisory Committee um, so you have some context of how and who generated this work. Then I'm going to launch into the first of the two major products, which uh, was a scientific synthesis that had three key sections to it. The first is sort of a primer on ecological spatial connectivity and why it matters for creating effective MPAs and MPA networks. The second then, following that, is uh, design, use, and management principles for enhancing connectivity processes inside, around, and among MPAs and MPA networks. And then we're going to turn to thinking about climate change, which is another compelling reason for why we think about and design MPAs um, with a knowledge of ecological spatial connectivity. Then I'm going to turn from that synthesis to uh, the recommendations and guidelines that were generated by this committee. We refer to this as the action agenda, and there's two 
pieces to that. One is recommendations to the Secretaries of Interior and Commerce, um, and then a, a suite of guidelines for enhancing connectivity in MPAs, um, which we think are actually applicable to any MPA program anywhere. And then hopefully we'll have plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. So uh, first I start with an image of the web page for the Federal Advisory Committee. And three uh, things I want to point out here. I've, the URL is indicated down here at the very bottom of this, this slide. Um, if you visit this site, you'll notice that the Advisory Committee includes representatives of diverse stakeholder groups. And, um, and it, this is important because the products that are generated by the committee um, reflect the diversity of experience and background and perspective on MPAs that this group brings. And you can learn more about each of those uh, members on the committee down at this lower link. You can also use this link in the lower right hand corner of the page to get to the products that we'll be talking about today. Um, so, but more specifically to the point of, of this call, um, I want to turn to why the Federal Advisory Committee um, paid attention or turned our attention to this issue of ecological spatial connectivity and climate change. And that was in response to a request by the secretaries of uh, the, Department, the Department of Interior and Commerce who asked, how can we incorporate knowledge about ecological spatial connectivity and climate change into the design, use, and management of effective marine protected areas and MPA networks? And so in response to that, we convened a subcommittee within the Federal Advisory Committee that myself and Sarah Robinson co-chaired, as Lauren mentioned earlier. And I've listed the other individuals within the committee, um, both to acknowledge their contributions to uh, the products that we'll be talking about, but also to, um, to indicate again the diversity of background that those people bring to, uh, to the products that we generated. Also, please note at the very bottom, uh, Charles Wally, who is the senior scientist at the National MPA Center, who is our liaison. He was our facilitator and, and really contributed valuably to, to the products that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so this is that page where the Federal Advisory Committee products reside and are posted. Um, and I just, again, want to bring to your attention, um, as highlighted in this red area, this is where you can come in and download all these products that we'll be talking about today. Okay, And again, the URL for this site is listed at the bottom of the, the slide as well. So let's start with the uh, first of the two key products uh, the committee generated. And this was the scientific synthesis. And there were three major sections of this scientific synthesis, which I mentioned earlier. The first, again, is that primer on ecological connectivity and why it matters for MPAs. Then the second, emerging from the former, is uh, design, use, and management principles. And then um, considerations of climate change and the relationships between climate change and connectivity um, and how important those contribute to the development, um, management of MPAs into the future. So starting with that first section on what is ecological spatial connectivity, let's first make sure we're all on the same page um, by uh, uh, introducing you to the, the definition that we use for ecological spatial connectivity, which refers to processes by which genes, organisms, populations, species, nutrients, and or energy move among spatially distinct habitats, populations, communities, or ecosystems. So note in this definition that it focuses on ecological connectivity across space and is the consequence of movement, movement of these uh, either species or materials, um, which is largely aided by patterns of ocean circulation. 
And we start by recognizing that there's four fundamental types of eco and scales of ecological spatial connectivity, um, which I've defined here as well. So the first that we'll talk about is population connectivity, which results from the movement of individuals of a single species among pap patchily distributed local or subpopulations. The second is referred to as gen genetic connectivity, which we oftentimes refer to as simply as gene flow, which again is the movement of genes among distinct populations of a single species, and it results from the movement of individuals, organisms, whether those are spores of marine algae or the eggs, larvae, juveniles, or adults of marine animals. Um, and the movement is among discrete populations. Um, the third is community connectivity, which results from the movement not just of one species, but multiple species that constitute um, ecological communities. And then ecosystem connectivity, which results from the movement of multiple species among distinct ecological communities, but also the movement of chemicals, such as nutrients and pollutants, um, energy, again, typically in the form of organisms, and materials like sediment or debris um, that moves from one ecosystem to the next. So <clears throat> to convey these concepts, we've created these cool little illustrations. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time on this first example because we'll be using these graphics throughout much of the presentation. So this first image, um, and if I can focus your attention um, at the upper panel, um, depicts what we refer to as population connectivity. This is oftentimes referred to as demographic connectivity to distinguish it from spatial genetic or population uh, connectivity. Um, and uh, this involves the movement of individuals between these distinct, spatially distinct populations. Uh, the collection of those populations that are connected by the movement of individuals is often referred to as a metapopulation. Um, and so this image uh, is uh, looking down on a coastline, the light tan colored area is the land, um, and then the blue is the adjacent ocean. And then I've depicted three different ecosystems or categories of ecosystems as you move from onshore to offshore. So you see in these embayments, uh, these very shallow inshore ecosystems, think of seagrass beds, mangroves, estuaries. Just offshore on the open coast, there are nearshore uh, ecosystems like kelp forest and temperate oceans, coral reefs and tropical oceans. And then as you continue to move offshore in deeper water, you encounter, say, deep rocky reefs in the temperate and coral deeper mesophotic reefs uh, in tropical, um, tropical uh, oceans. So what we've illustrated here is the movement of individuals by these dashed lines. Um, and in this case, the dashed lines represent the movement of propagules, right? So these are either larvae of animals or spores of algae. The blue line simply illustrates movement from one population inhabiting one ecosystem to the next. The orange line depicts movement of a population across a different ecosystem. Um, and that usually the, the vast majority of this movement is the result of the dispersal of propagules, the young that are generated by adults that are carried by ocean currents from one population to another. Now another way that, uh, that, um, that young disperse from one population to the next is depicted in the lower panel showing how the young may go into estuarine habitats this is why we refer to these as nursery habitats. And as they get older, they eventually migrate offshore as juveniles and may continue to migrate offshore uh, and to, to eventually returning to their adult habitat. So I want to underscore the importance of propagule dispersal um, and make sure that everybody appreciates that. So this is fundamentally different from terrestrial species whose young generally tend to remain in the same population that they're born into and thereby uh, replenish the same adult population. 
What you see here is not the case. The young that are produced by one population replenish some population elsewhere along the coast, and importantly, that leaves the original adult population reliant on the delivery of young from somewhere else to replenish that population. This has fundamental implications for how we think about marine protected areas, which we'll discuss. The second form of, uh, of um, ecological spatial connectivity is genetic connectivity. And that's the movement, as I mentioned, of genes among discrete populations. Um, and uh, oftentimes, across the range of a species, environmental conditions vary, say in a gradient. So imagine, for example, in this case, the yellow to blue depicts changes in water temperature along latitudinal gradients. Um, and what this does is it causes differences in selection for different types of genes. Um, and, you, and it leads to variation in the genetic composition of populations across those gradients. This gets accentuated if you have barriers to larval dispersal, like headlands or oceanographic features that reduce the movement of individuals and therefore the gene flow from one population to another. So it's important to recognize, therefore, that the genetic composition of a species can vary across its range. The third is community connectivity, and this is shifting from focus on the co connectivity of a single population or species to recognizing the, the importance of dispersal of multiple species that constitute a local community. And the important thing here is to recognize that for all those different species that constitute a community, they differ in their dispersal potential often related to the duration of their larval pelagic phase. And so I've depicted that here. The little red dashed lines um, depict short distance dispersal of a species. Uh, the black lines, intermediate dispersal. And then the blue line, long distance dispersal. Again, coinciding with short, intermediate, and long larval durations. And this is important because it's the combination of these different dispersal distances that result in the composition of species in a local community. And then there's ecosystem connectivity, which is the movement of nutrients, materials, and organisms from one ecosystem to another. So I've got a couple of different scenarios depicted here. On the left, again, we have the land mass and the near shore ecosystems. In this example, we have a, a, a temperate rocky reef that supports a kelp forest. Um, and that kelp forest eventually loses kelp blades and material that can be transported onshore, as depicted here in this little graph or illustration. Um, so there's this massive influx of carbon and nutrients as kelp is removed from these nearshore reefs and deposited inshore, or it can go offshore where it becomes a source, again, of, of nutrients and carbon down into uh, deep rocky reefs or submarine canyons that otherwise don't have their own source of primary production. In the other example, we have uh, connectivity that's created by the movement of organisms, in this case, fish in the tropics. So I mentioned that you have mangroves and seagrass beds that are important nursery habitat. And then they, as they get older, migrate out to and replenish adult populations offshore in shallow and deep coral reefs in this case. So that connectivity is fundamental to the persistence of populations um, because it, it, it involves multiple ecosystems supporting a given species. When an ecosystem uh, importantly contributes to either a population or nutrient influx to another ecosystem, that's referred to as a subsidy, which is an, a fundamentally important process for uh, influencing the productivity of different ecosystems. So that's all very cool. Now, we, we understand these four forms of ecological connectivity, but now what are the implications for how we use or design or manage either single MPAs or networks of MPAs? So I think everybody on the call probably knows what an MPA is, but let's just make sure we're all on the same page again. 
Uh, an MPA is a place-based conservation tool that's used in the marine environment. And more specifically, it's a regime of rules that restricts some or all human activities within a delineated area. And it's designed to protect that area or some or all ecological phenomena like a targeted species or a community or ecosystem within that area from the restricted activities and therefore uh, explicitly to achieve a specified conservation or management objective. So that's what I'm going to, uh, that's how I will be uh, using the term MPA. Um, and right off the bat, as we said, it, it pertains to specific MPA objectives. Um, and the MPA Center recognizes three uh, sort of uh, classes of MPA objectives that are illustrated here on the left hand side of this um, table. So it includes natural heritage MPAs that are designed to restore or maintain biodiversity, populations, communities, habitats, or ecosystems. Another MPA object objective is sustainable production and that's for sustainable fisheries and for sustainable extraction of some other renewable resource. And then the third category is cultural heritage and those are tangible or intangible resources that support cultural identity, cultural history. Now um, the ecological focus um, for any one of these different classes can either be for a particular species for example, a species that's considered uh, very important with respect to the cultural identity of a group or whole communities or ecosystems. So, so regardless of these three different categories, um, they can have either species or ecosystem foci. Um, and as such, what we're talking about uh, with respect to ecological spatial connectivity pertains to most of these different kinds of MPAs with an ecological focus. So um, this connectivity, the four forms of ecological spatial connectivity present significant challenges to a place-based management in the marine environment. We're gonna talk about those challenges and their implications for design. However, knowledge of these forms of spatial connectivity can be used in designing, managing, and, and applying MPAs for management goals. And it's our knowledge of this sp spatial connectivity that creates significant opportunities for creating, managing, and using MPAs that are effective in meeting their conservation and management goals. Right, so in fact, we argue that using our knowledge of ecological spatial connectivity is essential for designing and managing effective protected areas. So, how is it applied? We're back to that first illustration that I gave you for pop, the depicting population connectivity. Now I've superimposed a marine protected area um, and it's uh, on that, that um, central po population across a species range. And the important issue here, as I mentioned earlier, is that the populations within a protected area um, will oftentimes generate young that are carried away to replenish populations outside. That's important because it implies that, that uh, protecting an area can have consequences to the populations outside that area. But as I mentioned earlier, it also leaves those populations reliant on the delivery of young from outside that protected area, which means what the, the state of those populations outside has important implications for what you're trying to protect inside. And that's the, the case for either of these different forms of connectivity, population connectivity. Because of that reliance on delivery of young generated outside, um, this is the concept uh, that underpins one of the more important um, concepts that underpins this idea of a marine protected area network. So what we mean by an MPA network is a set of protected areas that are linked by ecological spatial connectivity processes. Right, so the network as a whole then contributes to the persistence of populations within and among those, those populations and MPAs 
as well as their genetic composition, the communities they constitute, and the ecosystems they inhabit across the MPAs and the, the populations and communities between those MPAs. So um, the concept of a network and uh, of MPAs is depicted here in the upper panel. We have um, uh, populations that are generating young that are carried out of the MPA in the blue lines. They're, pop they're replenishing populations outside of the MPAs, hopefully also contributing to the pop replenishment of populations within the next MPA. And then there's also the contribution from outside of, uh, of populations outside the MPAs um, to those adjacent MPAs as well. So then in the lower panel, Having been replenished, you see now that those populations in the middle MPA in turn contribute to the replenishment of the next MPA in the network and so on and so on. So that's the concept of connectivity. There's one key imp ap uh, implication of this idea of a network um, and it's the idea that multiple small M smaller MPAs can contribute to greater area of replenishment along a coastline. So to illustrate that, I've got this one large MPA and then the green uh, sphere around it depicts how far larvae are carried out of that, uh, from the populations within that, M from within that MPA. If you take this same area and you break it up and you distribute it along the coast with the same dispersal distances as depicted above, now you see how um, you increase the, um, the coverage of replenishment that's generated by that network. This is important because if you're a fisherman, for example, and they've just put this big no-take MPA uh, within this area, then you've lost fishing opportunity in this area. If you're a fisherman in this area, it's great because you're still fishing and you're getting replenishment from the adjacent MPA. But if you're further down the coast, there's real no significance or value to that MPA. Here instead, we see that it's much easier for fishing to be redistributed to areas that are actually um, getting uh, replenishment from, young, from adults that are from populations that are uh, protected within those MPAs. Um, turning to genetic connectivity, if one of our overarching goals is to protect the, bio, the genetic diversity of a species, then the clear implication of genetic connectivity is to locate MPAs in those different areas of different genetic composition so that across those MPAs in a network, you're actually protecting the breadth of diversity, genetic diversity of a given species. And then in community connectivity, again recognizing that different species disperse different distances, now uh, that has key implications for both the size and the spacing of protected areas in a network. So if we first look at the bottom panel where we have our short distance dispersers, there the implication is that the MPAs need to be big enough so that they encompass those dispersal distances. So those populations become self-replenishing within the protected area, especially given the fact that they're not going to eventually contribute to the replenishment of adjacent MPAs. In instead, if we look at intermediate dispersers, um, now we recognize that the distance, the spacing between these influences the extent to which the young generated by one MPA not only contribute to populations nearby, but also help replenish those po protected populations in adjacent MPAs. Um, and then, of course, long distance dispersers that are, are dispersing across the system. So for a given MPA, depending on its size and spacing, it will or will not be able to contribute to protecting all these different species with different dispersal distances uh, within a given community. And then there's ecosystem connectivity. And the key issue here is that the idea is to protect the integrity of these ecosystem of, of ecosystem connectivity to ensure that that the uh, uh, populations of kelp persist and continue to contribute to 
um, uh, the influx of energy to these adjacent ecosystems, clearly one thing to do is to try to encompass multiple ecosystems within a given marine protected area. Similarly, uh, if, we're, if the idea is to protect um, populations and, and the, the uh, connectivity of a population between different ecosystems, which has fundamental implications for the resilience of some of these systems, um, then the, again, the idea is to include multiple ecosystems within a given MPA to protect the integrity of the ecosystem connectivity. Okay, now we're going to quickly turn to the second section of the, of the um, synthesis, which is design and management principles for enhancing connectivity. Um, and these emerge from that first section. So with respect to design principles, um, clearly size matters, as we talked about. Um, for short distance dispersing uh, young, then the size of an MPA needs to be of sufficient size so that those populations are self-replenishing. Um, and as we just talked about, for long distance dispersers, multiple smaller MPAs can contribute to broader replenishment across a region than one single larger MPA. Location matters as well. Space at, spacing MPAs at distances that enhance replenishment among and in between MPAs is key to covering, uh, contributing to replenishment along a, a region. Um, and then distributing across spatial scales of genetic variation um, is key if the goal is to try to protect the d genetic diversity of a given species. And then third is, as I just mentioned, include multiple ecosystems, um, both uh, different kinds along the coast as well as on and offshore across depths. As we know, many species over their lifetime move between different ecosystems at different depths. So including those different ecosystems in a given MPA will contribute to that maintaining that connectivity. Um, but then there's also important management principles. We should recognize and management, excuse me, manage for strong interaction between populations both inside and outside MPAs. This is important. MPAs can contribute to the replenishment of populations outside. Recognize that. Realize that that's a, a tool that allows MPAs to contribute to populations beyond their boundaries. But they're also influenced by how well populations outside the MPA are managed because they can be reliant on larvae delivered from those populations outside. So this raises the point of discourse and, and co-management of MPA managers and other managers responsible for the state of systems outside the MPA. Recognize and manage for strong interaction between ecosystems inside and outside MPAs. MPAs can protect and enhance ecosystem connectivity like we just described, both within the bounds of that MPA. They can also contribute to subsidies outside that, that MPA, but also recognize that they're influenced by how well ecosystems are managed outside those MPAs as well. Think of things like terrestrial uh, it, uh, runoff right, that is contingent on how well that is managed, but has, can have direct impacts on the state of ecosystems within an MPA. The, the last, of course, is manage adaptively. Evaluate these design criteria, how well they work, and adapt them to enhance the effectiveness of a single MPA or a network. Okay, we're turned now to the third uh, section of the synthesis, which is the consideration of climate change. Um, and what I've started with is just a list of all the different environmental variables, not all of them, excuse me, but a bunch of them, to make the point that um, all of these different environmental variables are known to change with changing global climate. And as uh, one or many of these environmental variables change through time, they have uh, ecological consequences. There are ecological responses to these changes. So there's especially there's changes in the spatial patterns, the timing, and the rate of these ecological spatial connectivity forms that we described. That can in turn lead to changes in sizes of populations because changing environments will impact the survival or reproduction of populations, influencing the overall size. 
uh, one especially important consequence is shifts in species range and they, that occurs in two ways. They shift geographically as we know many species are changing their latitudinal distribution but they can also change in depth. They can move from shallow to deeper water to find refugia um, in uh, more preferred environmental conditions. The species genetic structure and diversity can change as you change gene patterns of gene flow or influence the relative survival of different subpopulations across a range. It also changes species composition of communities as you alter the relative abundance of species. It can change the strength of species interactions and the strength of ecosystem connectivity. Um, so that leads to fundamental uh, roles and design implications for protected areas. So the roles are illustrated in the black lettering and the implications for design are indicated in the blue. One role uh, impl one, one implication is to create population buffers that uh, enhance the population resiliency within an MPA, right, protect those populations so that there will be a larger size as they are subjected to climate change. And they uh, have been shown to re rebound sooner and then remember they're going to generate young that replenish populations outside the MPA. You do that by ensuring that single MPAs and networks are of sufficient size, spacing, and you protect the ecosystems that support all the life stages of a given species. Another, another role is to protect refuge populations that may be more resistant to climate effects, right? These are species or, or excuse me, populations of a species that have been adapted to stressful environments. So include populations that persist in these stressful environments, whether it's a high acidity or high temperature or uh, uh, stressful salinities that are capable of withstanding and replenishing other populations. Um, another is to protect, protect genetic diversity, which is the capacity to evolve to changing conditions. And you do that, as we said, by distributing MPAs across a species range and across the environmental gradients and barriers that encompass a species genetic diversity. Um, you can protect the role of strong interactors that enhance ecosystem resilience and resistance. And again, the, the implication for design is to ensure that single MPAs and networks are of sufficient size and spacing and protect the ecosystems that support all the life stages of those really important species that influence the rest of their ecosystem. Um, facilitate shifts in species ranges by protecting suitable habitat for colonization. Again, whether that's geographic, shifts in range or shifts in depth. Create networks that protect ecosystems for species to colonize as they shift their ranges tracking these tolerable environmental conditions. Um, also include ecosystems across a range of depths to accommodate species shifts in depth distribution. Then protect the strength of ecosystem connectivity that enhances resiliency. So a classic example is nursery habitats where you, pr you uh, protect young that eventually recruit to and enhance um, the state of ecosystems offshore. So include multiple ecosystems within a single MPA um, and across the networks to enhance species, energy, and nutrient transfer uh, among ecosystems. Um, and then I think the last of these is provide managers with tools to evaluate separate, uh, I'm sorry, this is, this is focused on the role. Think about new roles of marine protected areas in the world of a changing climate. And, uh, and so the first is to provide managers with tools to evaluate the separate and combined effects of climate change and other anthropogenic stressors. So for example, you could compare the state of populations in and out of MPAs uh, where fishing either does or does not exist um, that is, are both being subjected to similar climate change. Um, and, and so this is a tool that, you, that managers could use, but it will require careful consideration of the distribution of human stressors because you don't want to um, accidentally confound other kinds of stressors with the particular um, uh, um, 
human activities that you're trying to evaluate relative to climate change. The other is to use MPAs as sentinels for monitoring environmental effects of climate change and, and their ecological questions, excuse me, ecological consequences. So again, if you're out there monitoring an MPA to evaluate its performance, uh, monitor the environment and now you can see how the environment is changing and the ecological consequences of those changes. And importantly then you need to think about where you locate these to, to um, subject them to these different kinds of environmental effects. So uh, then a, a quickly um, a consideration for management of MPAs. Um, recognize that connectivity informed MPAs and networks are best able to meet conservation objectives in a changing marine environment. Right? They allow species to use the full extent of their range um, and it protects the diversity of species to, to, um, to adapt to those changes. But realize that, that you need to monitor, evaluate, and adaptively manage those MPAs and their networks. You need to determine how effective they are and the ability to make changes if necessary to make them that much more effective. So that uh, involves monitoring, evaluation, and adaptive management that again requires clear articulation of the MPAs or networks conservation objectives. Right, You're managing for a particular objective. Okay, now I'm going to shift to the action agenda, which again I mentioned has six recommendations to the Secretaries of Interior and Commerce, and then secondly a suite of guidelines for broader application. So I'm just going to paraphrase uh, each of these, but they're in here for you guys to take a look at um, if you uh, download the presentation. The first one is for the secretaries to immediately strengthen the effectiveness and resilience of MPAs within their respective jurisdictions. And this is important because much of the area in MPAs in U.S. waters is under, the juris uh, is under federal jurisdiction. So what the secretaries do can have large consequences for these uh, pursuing these efforts. Secondly, urge and aid, aid other MPA agencies and programs, whether it's the federal government, state, tribal, territorial, or local governments, to c enhance connectivity in their systems. Develop secretarial level guidance, resources, and expectations. Get this information out to people, demonstrate what your expectations are, and, and foster the, the application of these guidelines among these different groups. Use government and academic experts to develop measures of connectivity. This, this, uh, what we know about measuring connectivity is in its infancy, and it's going to take a lot of work to develop uh, cost-effective tools and approaches. And so, work with others uh, across agencies and outside of the federal government to pursue the development of measuring connectivity. Lead efforts to ensure funding and capacity for. MPA managers to monitor, evaluate, and adaptively manage their system, and then improve collaboration across the departments of commerce and the interior so that you're working together to leverage the expertise, resources, and your efforts. Turning to the guidelines, um, the, and I'm going to go through these quickly because we're running short on time. Um, use existing scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge about connectivity. Figure out what your connectivity looks like. Um, examine important external inputs. Evaluate how climate change may impact those uh, mechanisms of connectivity, those four different forms. Build on the knowledge that you already have and evaluate how and where connectivity should be enhanced. And again, engage others to participate in this process. Um, this is enhancing connectivity and resilience within your existing MPAs and there's a list of 10 of them. I, I just want to talk about the first three, which, are social, which uh, underscores spatial considerations. First, think inside the box. Think about how connectivity influences what you're trying to conserve within a given MPA and, and ensure that you're protecting those uh, mechanisms of connectivity. Then think outside the box. Think about how your MPA is influencing populations beyond its boundaries and think of how 
management actions in nearby are affecting what you're trying to protect within your MPA. But also think way outside of the box. Realize that there are things that are happening way inland, agricultural practices, forestry practices that are influencing, um, uh, say, runoff, terrestrial runoff, that can have a direct influence on the resources you're trying to protect in your MPA. Think about spatially where those different activities are occurring um, and how, who you might interact with to co-manage those activities to the benefit of your MPA. Um, let's go to cre uh, create resilient MPAs and MPA networks. Um, start with these guidelines, anticipate climate change impacts, um, apply these design principles that we've provided, uh, build uh, MPA stepping stones, right? Think of the, in the context of networks for the reasons that we've argued uh, and that also help to replicate key habitats across the, re the, the network. Um, and of course, uh, uh, manage adaptively, applying best practices, and think about how you're going to use MPAs to inform ocean management, especially in the face of a changing environment. So that's it. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how this works next, but um, it would be great to entertain thoughts, not just questions, but comments and ideas that others might have. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, and we do have some, some interesting questions and comments. So uh, thanks to those who sent them in, and feel free to send others. We'll take as many as we have time for. So here's a comment from Ben Best who says, so far, connectivity is only viewed as a positive, and MPAs used to enhance connectivity. Are there negatives to connectivity? Yeah, for instance, does ensuring ahead. isolation or infrequent connectivity reduce risk of ex exportation from disease um, and do you have uh, recommendations about the right balance? Right on. No, th thanks for mentioning that because I, I had hoped to uh, sort of emphasize that point in those guidelines with that idea of um, how, how terrestrial runoff, you know, is sort of a classic uh, um, detrimental effect uh, potentially to coastal MPAs. Um, and so uh, thinking outside of the box in two different ways. I, I referred to sort of the spatial component. Really look how far away human activities or natural phenomena may detrimentally affect what you're trying to protect in your MPA and think about what you do or, and, and work with others that have management authority for the activities in those distant places. But like you mentioned, um, it's not just, uh, I mean, think about the variety of things that are likely to influence um, your system through connectivity. Disease is a classic one. Invasive species is another. Uh, we talked about the influx of nutrients, or, or like at eutrophication, um, sediment influx that smothers species. So there are, in fact, a whole slug of different um, ways that especially ecosystem population connectivity can have detrimental effects. Um, and I think the fundamental implication of that is twofold. One, like we said, think about how you manage to prevent those things from ever um, uh, being delivered to your system. Secondly, recognize that the state of the system that you're protecting affords some level of resistance or resilience to those perturbations. Um, and, and, and explore that, evaluate just how well uh, the level of protection that your system, your MPA is providing contributes to the resistance of that, those effects of connectivity. Okay, thanks. Uh, we actually have a couple of questions that have a similar theme around the difficulty of, of having data on multiple species and the um, distribution characteristics of multiple species and how you do, might design an MPA network uh, around uh, multiple species and wondering, are there examples of MPAs that have done that? Yeah, a really good question um, and, a, and a big question. So there is an example. Um, I, I uh, was very involved in the state of California's uh, planning process for the development of the, the statewide network of marine protected areas. 
and these questions of, uh, of um, species distributions and community structure were core to thinking about uh, the, the, um, their implications for locating protected areas, especially the spacing between them. Um, and so we were fortunate because uh, in California, for the most part, there was a wealth of information uh, that was collected on the distributions of communities up and down the coast. Um, and then uh, with that information and knowing how those communities vary from one region to another, that informs uh, the design of the network to ensure that you're placing MPAs across that variation in communities, right? So for example, I work on kelp forests. Kelp forests in Southern California are fundamentally different from kelp forests in Central California or Northern California. And if you're going to protect the biodiversity supported by a kelp forest, the implication is put MPAs across those th that scale of variation. Um, <clears throat> the other one is uh, with respect to dispersal, and that's tough because you've got all these species that are dispersing varying distances. Um, and for the most part, we actually have pretty reasonable estimates, generic estimates of dispersal distances. And, uh, and they are generic. And so um, you can use sort of ballpark estimates of dispersal. Uh, and, and most importantly is focusing on those sort of intermediate dispersal distances. Because the self-replenishing, the short distance dispersers, you just want to make sure they're self-replenishing in an MPA. But get a feel for those, those inter intermediate dispersers in a community that would strongly influence how far apart you're distributing um, MPAs in a network. And we came up with uh, reasonable estimates of that. And now, of course, we're trying to evaluate how well those estimates play out. Next. So related to that, uh, Max Westhead, who's involved in MPA planning in the Canadian Maritimes, it talks about her process a little bit and says, we certainly don't have data for all our species. Would you recommend focusing on a few key indicator species? And how would you apply this connectivity guidance at an ecosystem scale? Yeah, um, I think one thing that you could do if you were going to look at key indicator species is evaluate those species that are important, strong interactors within given communities. Um, like, uh, and also think about economically important species and focus on those species that are both ecologically and or economically important um, and, and focus on their dispersal distances, their movement patterns, their distributions, their population distributions to initially build up that sort of geographic template that you would apply MPAs across. But it, it, you know, with this, I, I, I understand completely the concern. Um, you know, we're thinking about this likewise along the coast of British Columbia, and um, and where there is a paucity of uh, survey data that characterizes this um, is uh, is problematic. And, and in one sense, like we had in California, it almost suggests to just get out there and do some initial sampling with the sole goal of characterizing these this geographic variation in communities and ecosystems. Okay, and actually uh, related to that last sentence, uh, Jennifer Warlow asks, what tools do you use to predict connectivity, especially of planktonic propagules? Yeah, excellent. So that's a huge area, of course, right? Um, and, and as I mentioned, you know, the, the development of these tools to estimate patterns of connectivity is sort of in its infancy. It's typically a combination of, of, th of three or four things. One is to, to uh, um, most importantly, is to try to understand patterns of ocean circulation, right? Because no matter how long the larval duration is, that or ocean circulation will dictate the degree of connectivity among populations or ecosystems along a coast. So one fundamental tool is models of, of ocean circulation patterns. 
The second one is, as we were talking about earlier, is just these ballpark estimates of larval duration which then you can apply to those models to get some gross estimates of how far and where propagules are dispersed in those models. And then another third uh, approach is to actually get empirical estimates, whether you're doing that, um, excuse me, let me step back, and critical to, uh, to applying um, propagules within those models is how long do you put them in the model for. So these are these estimates of larval duration. Um, but, you know, for temperate species, for example, they're pretty robust, right? I mean, um, for fishes and many of the invertebrates, you're talking about a two-month larval duration. Two to three-month larval duration is a reasonable one. In the tropics, it's more like one month. Um, and so those, just those generic ballpark estimates of larval duration that are informed um, in various ways um, uh, from the literature uh, is, a, is a fine rule of thumb to at least initially start looking at these dispersal patterns uh, along a coastline. And now, of course, we're using genetic tools that are extremely powerful but are still kind of expensive. Um, but when possible, boy, genetics is, is the fourth element. Looking at patterns of genetic structure or using genetic signatures to identify where young go is, is an especially important empirical approach to validate the model predictions. And, and I will just put in a plug for a recent article on open channels on some of these genetic tools. If you go on open channels and I think search um, tools for monitoring large ocean areas. You'll find some really great summary of some of the research going on there. Cool. Um, so he, there's a question, of, you've talked a lot about larval dispersal and, uh, and larva in general, and there's a question about other types of species, um, sea turtles, whales, birds. Yeah. Um, any thoughts about how those fit into the connectivity picture for designing MPAs? Yeah, boy, thanks for bringing that up. So. Um, the, as you saw by the illustrations that I was um, presenting, that I'm, I'm thinking largely of coastal network. We, we the group, were thinking of uh, largely of coastal uh, MPAs and not sort of what we refer to as open ocean or pelagic MPAs that might be designed to um, protect uh, more transient, more much, much more mobile, larger species in in offshore waters. Um, but even for those species, many of them have a strong anchor to the coastal environment, right? Where seabirds and marine mammals, turtles, all have important rookeries. So the important this is a is an excellent example of co-management. So what an MPA can do is it can protect those coastal habitats that are fundamentally important for those species, whether they're um, nesting areas or feeding areas or nursery habitat areas. An MPA can enhance the integrity and productivity of the ecosystems or habitats that those species depend on. But then as they leave that MPA, they are now subject to other management restrictions. And so again, if, you're, if the idea is to protect that species, you're, you're going to have to work with um, the people, with the, the management authorities that influence the um, human impacts on those species out in the open ocean. So there are a lot of other questions. We probably have time for one more, and it's about climate change. Uh, Daniel Holstein asks, we expect climate change to shift patterns of connectivity. So how do we promote connectivity-driven MPAs that incorporate the temporal and spatial uncertainty? Yeah, really good question. And there's, that, there's some excellent papers that are starting to come out now um, and uh, uh, identifying these predicted shifts in, in current patterns that in turn lead to changes in the, the trajectories, the spatial patterns of connectivity. And, and I th the only, um, uh, right, and, and I think that's something that's on the, the horizon that we need to really sit down and scrutinize uh, what are the management responses. One thing for sure 
is that I it, still I think the network idea that is distributing protected ecosystems uh, across the range of those potential shifts in connectivity so that you're protecting areas um, such that when connectivity patterns shift there may be an MPA that will then um, uh, you know, foster colonization and the and the distributional shift of a species, but but to get more uh, specific, other than um, other than to just simply try to distribute these protected areas across all those air the the uh, potential shifts in connectivity patterns, um, it's essentially like spreading risk. Uh, in a in a meta population or meta community model um, is probably all we can do right now um, I assume but boy uh, that is uh, I think where the discussion needs to go into the future probably a great reason to make that the last question is <laughs> I think that uh, MPA designers um, need to really ponder how to approach uh, the design of networks to facilitate that well, Mark, I really want to thank you. This has been a great discussion, and there are a few questions that we didn't get to, uh, which just indicates, I think, the level of interest in this topic. Uh, one of the things that I take away from all the work the advisory committee did is that even though there are a lot of unknowns, we know enough to get started to act on this. And I think the, the advice that you've given to the management agencies is going to be really useful to, to help spur that action. So I, I want to thank you and Sarah and all the subcommittee members and of course open channels and ABM tools. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Yes, thank you, Lauren. This has been great and, and you'll see both Sarah and my email addresses so that if you want to continue this discussion, at least we can try to pursue it online. Thank yeah, you very and we much. Can, we can also send you the webinar report so you'll see the questions we didn't get to and we will also be posting the slides on the marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov website and the recording on the Open Channels website. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.